In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. Today, if you're looking for one of those podcasts about movies and video games and arcades, that's down the street. Here, this is a podcast about movies about books. And my guest today, who assures me she won't be making any beep 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 beeps, is Jessica Linverdi. Now, Jessica, is the never-ending story a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade? I'd like to clarify that I did not sign a contract that said I'm not going to do beeps. Look, I just I just want to be honest. The guy says this is not about beep 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 beeps. You got to go down the street for that, and then he and then the kid steals the book. <laughs> uh, I just don't know what's going to overtake me. So if I'm, and you're beep, and you're beep, worried beep, that beep, beep beep beeps might be the thing that hits you. You know how like when you, because you said something that it makes me now want to do it. You've now implanted the idea. Like the don't think about elephants. Now I'm thinking about elephants. Yeah, yeah. You, well, I mean that's the Inception joke. Oh, well, you just incepted beep, 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 beep into my head. Anyway, uh, Never Ending more, uh, never ending Story has not been remade. Right. So and, our, and we're here to so say... So will it be or should it be? So is it something that probably will be or is it something that should be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Hmm. I think it... Here's what I think is actually going to happen. I don't think it's going to be remade as, like, what we're going to talk about today. Like, I think what's end up, what ends up going to... If it actually happens, if someone's like, oh, we want to do a never-ending story again, they will create a whole new story in Fantasia about, like, they'll do a never-ending story three, but not call it never-ending story three. So they would do something more along the lines, like, what's happening with the Dark Crystal, or? I don't know what the Dark Crystal is. We're going to have a conversation. I know. Um, I, is that That's the other 80s amazing film. Oh, uh, no, I hate the Dark Crystal. Oh. Um, but the. <laughs> got it, got it. But it's it's an eighties it's the eighties Jim Henson dark fantasy. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah, and something that everyone tells me I have to see, and I have. So you it, might like it. I probably would. So like, imagine it would. De- I think it would be never ending story twenty years from now, or twenty years from the original movie. Like, or what what happens thirty years later, or what happened? Like, basically, what they did with Mary Poppins. Let's move it up. So in would you time. describe it as something more that happens like with Mary Poppins, or would you describe it more like uh, Jumanji? The Jumanji movie that came oh, out with The Rock. I think it would be more Jumanji because, like, we're not following those kids again. Mm-hmm. We're seeing it's a soft sequel. We're a soft sequel. Soft sequel with the same name. Same name, or like, still, the Fantasia exists in its same form, but you get to see so much more of it than well, you have. Well, then let's get into this. My one of the questions, and so, what someone mentioned to me when I was talking about doing the show, is like, every time someone reads that book, does Fantasia die? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Here's what I think. I think that kid needed that story at that time. So that book, that happened, that story happened for him in that way. Okay. So I, that actually... So now it's, it's room of requirement, but in book form. It's room of requirement. Exactly right. Because I think when that man, that creepy old man mm-hmm. in the room is reading the book, it's not about Fantasia as Bastion sees it. No. Okay. Uh, so his version of the book is slightly different. About being a creepy old man and how to not be a creepy old man I mean, in Fantasia. He is for sure a creepy old man. He he brings that child in real close. It's really uncomfortable. Super uncomfortable. I, I was very uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> it's you know when you think about it, it's really in the eighties. It's a white man bringing another white kid into his confidence. And you're supposed to trust that guy. You know, it's like you don't think about it as being weird in that in that era. Well, if it start, it's an initially abusive man, and then the kid's like, "But I'm like this. I'm already so, so, sort of broken." And the guy's like, "Really? Oh, he's so rude. Come in here. I fucking hate kids. You know, it's yeah. so bad." And then like the kids like, "I've read books," and then he just lists like books like Treasure Island or Treasure. <laughs> Treasure Island and all these other books, and the guy's like, oh, well, and three interestingly, books. You, that you say that, it's making me think he is his own first gate and second gate into Fantasia. So he's actually, so you remember, like, Atreyu has to walk through the gate to prove oh, and yeah, know yeah, his yeah, self worth. Kind of Bastion's doing that with him. So it, this guy may or may not like kids, but he's actually is in himself the Oracle, which I don't like that he is, but he's. He's also the Oracle is going, well, this kid is actually worthy of this book. He proved himself twice. And now he gets the book. Mm. 
Let's talk about the gates. Okay. Well, so for yeah, let's talk about the gates. So for the gates, what the the way it works is you have to know your self worth in order to get past the gates. But my theory is is that like because it's magic and whatever, and but I just see them as like motion detection. And it's just, like, <laughs> someone who's, like, supremely confident, like, yeah, I'm going to make it through this gate, whatever. And they're just, like, casually strolling in, boom, dead. But Atreyu was like, oh, no, I got to run or shit's going to get crazy. I can swear, by the way. You can swear. I am oh, definitely going to. All right. Just wanted a heads up. It's like, no, no, no. These sphinxes are nuts because they're just always firing lasers. Because sure. they did shoot at him. Sure. He just was running so fast and he jumped ahead of where they were going to shoot. I actually thought, I, I, I see that and it, and it can be that. But I actually thought it was a great metaphor for how your knowing self, one's self-worth can waver. I agree. And and that's what it's really meant to illustrate. Of course. Um, it, that being said, it is, you know... It is the motion detection, and then we're just going to kill that kid. But but that knight does die because he freezes, right? The, the, I've always the, thought it, it was a, 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 a caution against overconfidence. Mm. Oh, well, that guy was overcompensating because he was wearing, like, the first knight that dies that oh. they watch dying. He, he's he wearing just, the... I mean, he was wearing fancy knight armor from... Which is equivalent, the, the, the mega truck, you know, for, like, the guys who drive the big race oh. trucks. Eh. I mean, theoretically, totally. there's two gates, right? And then, but no one really knows what the second gate is. I feel like he was more prepared for the second gate because we don't know what that is. Meaning what? He was prepared for whatever was coming next. He knew he was just going to breeze by the first gate. He didn't know that. Oh, you mean the the the, the knight? The knight. The knight was like, I got this, but I don't know what's next. So now I'm going to be prepared for that. Oh. It's preparation and overconfidence. Ooh, interesting. I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, I mean, Here, just because thing- the scientist says that it's, oh, you, the armor makes it worse. The armor doesn't make it worse. You're just going to die. I do think both things can be true. But now I beg yeah. this question. Is Atreyu set up for failure by knowing what the or the, that first gate is? Does oh, he yeah, succeed? Oh, yeah, because all of a sudden you start, it, it's the same thing we did at the start. The seed of damage was, da- the seed of damage. The seed, seed of, of damage. The seed of doubt was planted of. Are you worthwhile? Because here's the thing: like, if it's someone who just knows their self worth, maybe they just do. But all of a sudden, if, like, if it if there's a giant sign of only someone who knows their self worth will get past here, then it's like, do I know my self worth? I don't know. What am I just thinking? What's going on? And then, zap. He's almost better off never talking to that weird, creepy little yeah, man. Yeah, because he would just be like, because like the way he walks into the uh, the, the first chambers and sees uh, Charon. Which is the name of that dude? Oh, I thought it was Chiron. It might be Chiron. Chiron it's makes Cairo, more sense. Cairo, sim- similar to Cairo. Ooh, that's probably correct. It's not spelled like the word Chiron, but I'm sure that's the way it's pronounced. Yeah. When he speaks to Chiron, and he's just like, "Yeah, I'm the only Atreyu there is, and I'm the best warrior that my uh, my people have." That confidence, absolutely, he'd have gotten through. Because he wouldn't have second guessed himself. No, but all, but but that's... then all of a sudden he's like emotionally damaged by within five minutes losing his horse. Okay, so unpopular opinion, I. Uh, the film is good and has nostalgia, but it's so boring now. It's so boring. It's it, you can I I advise my friends like don't rewatch it. You're gonna just you just remember the movie mm-hmm. and you're gonna enjoy it more. So then let's open with this. The first time I ever saw this movie was a year, maybe two years ago. Oh, I first saw it as an adult. Oh, interesting. I did that with Labyrinth too. Yeah, I saw Labyrinth for the first time as an adult as well. But I think I enjoyed Labyrinth more than I enjoyed this movie. Sure, sure. Because I feel like this is a movie that that trades almost exclusively on nostalgia interesting because exactly what you said it's it moves slow now and it's hard to go back and rewatch it but it's something that you remember enjoying really well so what was your first experience with this movie do you remember the first time you saw it not necessarily i think it's one of those films that's like on tv so you catch three uh uh, three scenes of it and that's all you remember you know is that how you first saw the movie i think that's probably true because i was young yeah um like to the point, like for rewatching it for this, I ne- don't think I've ever seen the first scene with the dad. Oh, really? Which can we just talk about how weird it is that he's drinking orange juice and a whipped fucking egg? That's what he's making in the back. Is it? It's unbelievable. I miss that entirely. So, well, while the kid is, while he's like at the table, the dad is pouring fucking orange juice into a blender and cracks an egg, whips it up. And it's just drinking it nonchalant. I, I, okay, so the dad's a monster. A monster! What the f- It's like such a weird character choice. What, what was crazy for me is that, I mean, this kid is like, 
like this kid's clearly struggling, but instead of like, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? What's wrong? It's stop fucking up. Well, that's not un. It's uh, not uncommon for the time, especially. Of course not. Like that man has is no is not in touch with his feelings whatsoever. Yeah, that man was awful. Uh, well, I think it was allegorical of the time. Of course, but I think it was allegorical of the time of saying this probably isn't okay. Well, I, I it's don't, clearly I don't think that not, they were, right? I don't think they were excusing that as positive father behavior. I think they were saying this is the way fathers are. Not it's good. It's not great, Not right? good. Yeah. yeah. I, that's, I, that, that's my takeaway, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So when I suggested we do this podcast, this was the movie that you kind of pretty quickly went to. What, what was it about this movie that made you want to talk about it? Because it's slow. <laughs> because it's, because okay. it's not good upon rewatch. Mm-hmm. Because it, mean, it meant so much. And I think there is something good here. I think there's a good story to be told. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also like you, you. Some people would be like, "Don't remake something that everyone loves," and, and I disagree. Well, I don't disagree necessarily. I, I I love it. I don't want anyone to touch it. Let's leave it. But I but I'd love to watch it again, and I want it to be a more interesting watch. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at with it. I the way I look at a movie like this is it's something that you presumably really enjoyed when you were a kid, but I feel like you'd have a hard time having a kid sit down to watch it now because it's slow and it's not as dynamic. And quite frankly, as cool as the luck dragon is, there are a lot of things that are scary in this movie. The luck dragon would have freaked me the frick would out. Have really? Yeah, it's the oh, luck dragon in particular. Come on. Because it's so it's so close and it's uncanny valley and just the animatronics of it and just like the way their mouths move has it like just gives me Oh, Ugh. I couldn't disagree more. But I think you're right. It is the it's well it's the childhood it's the childhood suspension of disbelief. Sure. When you're watching that I think the thing that's hard watching it as an adult now is we see all the strings. We see all the, the, the mouth isn't moving normally or, or they're trying. As a kid, you're not paying attention to that. You're just. No, no, no. You're just in. Yeah. And I think that's kind of why it's hard to watch it as an adult now. And, and I don't know that you couldn't show it to a kid and they'd like it. I think. I mean, it's certainly worth a shot. I think they would. Let's go steal a child. No. Why? Because we, we just said that's what we had to do. No, you're on the level with the weird librarian guy. I didn't st- the Carl? librarian didn't steal the kid. His name is Carl Conrad Coriander, which yes. is really weird. Carl the bookshop. Owner. I think he call. I think he does pick up the phone, and goes Coriander's books or something like that. I'm. It's weird that like of all the characters in the movie to have a last name, it's the bookshop owner. Well, it's obviously, well, the, I'm sure the book Bastion is doesn't have a last name no but he doesn't need it no. it's relatively unimportant so what happens is bastion steals this book from carl with the note he says he's gonna return it yeah i mean yes. it was basically like i bet you can't read this book eh? Eh? oh yeah 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 and so bastion steals this he goes into school and sees that they're doing a, a like he's walking to school with the book under his shirt like the most subtle kid in the bastion's an idiot but so <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i mean he's an idiot like all kids are idiots yeah, I'm not... He has a backpack. Yes. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He's... He has a uh, a satchel. He does not have a backpack. Yeah, he was... He's a, a young adult. <laughs> yeah. Which... He's, I, he's on, uh, he's on the holiday. Thing. I thought that was funny because it was clearly one of those things like uh, his bag was slightly different than all the other kids' bags. Mm. So I think it's it's a um, just a production design kind Choice. of joke. Oh, like, totally. Oh, no, you're not the kid who gets the backpack. You're already weird because you don't have a backpack. You have to run with this side bag. Uh, also, can we just talk about that attic? That that attic has one too many skeletons. <laughs> so and so then so he's at the it's school. Too much. I know they're doing this test. He goes through a room where there was a key in the door. He opens it. He did he have the no, key? No, no. So the attic. I guess there was a break glass in case of an emergency, like thing on the wall. Uh-huh. And either the attic keys are in there and it's broken, or that's where he stashes the attic keys. Got it. So. uh he just basically, he, it's not the, it can't be his first time in there. No, it of seems course like not. That's where he goes to hide. That's what the whole deal is. And if if there was just a random black box theater in the attic of my school to go to, then sure, why not? It's just like, also, where do those candles come from? Like, it's, it's weird and creepy, and it doesn't belong to be the attic of a school. Not at all. So the only way that makes sense to me is that it is the black box theater that that school has, because those are all the props and random things from all the shows. It's definitely and that's storage just where they for keep that. Them. It's definitely storage for that. But it's just, yeah, you're right. It's incongruent to the, the shape of any school building. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
But it worked. I don't know. Ugh, God. Anyway, also it's like so much unused space. But also, for where's the fucking search team to find this child? Exactly. <laughs> no one's looking for this kid. Not that I he's think they're there until midnight. You know he's there till midnight. Oh yeah. You don't finish that book in the no, school. No, absolutely. At not. seven p.m. at night. No, school gets out. They the bell rings. Everyone leaves. He goes back upstairs and keeps reading the book. Now here's the thing. Even if there was a search party, I don't think they're going to go. Well, he must be in the attic of the school. I mean, I would no, start checking. True. I would start checking the local dumpsters because clearly they're big hangout points. But I'd fucking beat that kid's ass. I mean, I don't condone spanking, but if he like hid out in the in the attic, I, I he that, wouldn't see the light of day if if we for an, a year. I mean, that'll fix it. No, I know. I I actually just said that in a very my father version. I'd fucking beat the kid. I would not. And I know it just sounded. Like, I mean, that kid's. You can edit that out, right? Uh, <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> okay, great. I might have to take another donor as payment, but um, the, I mean, this poor kid he has, like, clearly is just like the stereotypical movie version of the kid with no friends who doesn't find joy in anything, and it's just he, he needs a support group. He needs people in his life. Yeah, he and needs it, and it's 2019. Hard. Yeah, that's the thing. Like that kid would be killing it in 2019 totally so there is an argument especially of like the jock era of the 80s that like the nerds won yeah especially with internet mm-hmm. like it, it, all of a sudden the thing that we value is not this brute force thing mm-hmm. i mean it also so actually this segues very nicely into what my pitch would be please go for it uh that is is that we would set Basically, so what we're dealing with is Bastion dealing with the trials of having to grow up and his own self-worth and self-image, right? Sure, like sure. The fear, despair, all these things, what happens that you're asked to do as you're growing up in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think we t- flip it a little bit and start dealing with the traps of the internet instead. Mm. So all the things can remain the same, but we're dealing with it in the lens of how a kid might experience bullying in this world or not being accepted or what the, it, like the internet says about your self image and all those things. So that's, uh, that's what I'm thinking with it. I agree with that. Yeah. So then, I mean, I do, cause there still are very much kids who just really enjoy just being on their own, sitting and reading a book that are still going to get made fun of. And absolutely. And the kid who separates themselves from the rest of the other kids, kids are awful. They're cruel to each other. And what's going to end up happening is that kid's going to get made fun of for not hanging out with the rest of the kids. And also, let's That's not forget. That's unfortunately a universal. He's also going through depression, too. Yeah. We're just not dealing with it. We're not it, the, the movie itself, as it exists no. right now, is not talking about it. He's dealing with his mother's death. and Well, the other issue is that he goes through all this and then sort of learns the wrong lesson. Okay, what do you mean? Well, he then gets on the luck dragon and then goes and torments the people who were tormenting ah, him. So that's where I change it. Too. Yeah, I changed it for because that that's the eighties, though. Of course, and, that's that's the revenge fantasy. And honest to God, I don't want to show my kids that necessarily no. for that purpose. It's no, kind not of like, all. oh, let's just let Prince Charming save us. Like that's the danger in showing all the old mm-hmm. Disney stuff to kids because it definitely fucked me up for sure. I feel like it'd be something where. Doing the story, telling the thing, like, not only does he learn, he, I, what I feel like is necessary is that this book, in addition to being its own story and portal and everything, I think that he also has to meet another kid who's somewhere else reading the same book. Oh. Because I don't think he needs to go and interact with the bullies anymore. I don't think that he needs to bring in something that wins them over because I don't think that's realistic. And I honestly don't think that's a good message. I think this book needs to be about finding the people who, about finding your people. Ah, man. Like, literally, if it ends up being, like, just finding your fellow adventurers, finding the other people, and just, like, when it goes to that big empty space, it's, I mean, this was our world, but we can rebuild it, and hey, the same thing happened to the kid over here who was reading the book. What kid? And all of a sudden, there's another kid there who's been reading the exact same story. Oh, that's so interesting. And I disagree, because the story I'd rather tell is how do we find common ground with people that we don't agree with? So, again, it goes back to the internet, how we can all be so polarized, and, Mm -hmm. you know, this country is not doing very well because of how we've been, we're just harping on our differences. Yeah. And, And there's certainly something to be said for finding something that ties everyone together, but, and and I agree with that. Um, I also think that there's something to be said for, 
I just don't want to have to waste time on someone like this who's a jerk. I fucking totally agree. But if we give up, if we're losing empathy for even the bullies. Oh, sure. That, don't get me wrong. I'm the person I am because I found All my right, Well, then here's my pitch. Okay. So the it opens with those three bullies. They're running around. They're punishing him, whatever. What if one of the other people who's reading the book was one of those bullies? Oh, I love that. That's actually a really bland, good blend of the idea. Because that, he's also misunderstood in his own way. He is, and he's also the kid who, instead of just the, being the one who stand out, is like, you guys want to do this? Sure, I'm on board. Whatever you guys say, I'm going to go with whatever you guys want to do. Or That kid. Or Bastion gives the bully the book. Yeah. Or something like that. Because I actually re- wrote it that Bastion takes Falcor into the real world, in my pitch, and takes the bullies to Fantasia to kind of go, hey, here's what here's what's going on. I like that idea. Yeah, but I kind of, both could work. I I I would like it more if it's one of the bullies and like like he finds he could that start one friend. The... Yeah, start small, get big, yeah. grow bigger. I, I like totally that idea. agree. All right, cool. Yeah, I All love right. that idea. Fun. All right, so that's th- those are the <laughs> broad strokes. No, it's it's worse. Those are the bookends. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what? Actually, I got to go. So. All right. I, I respect that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Do you have anything you want to plug? Uh- <laughs> also, no, I don't. Because <laughs> uh, I actually have to, you know, pull my rights to this. So um, okay, could you imagine? Um, so, I, so then let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about the rest of the book. Let's talk about chapters two through, I don't know, whatever. I like the idea of it being like, all of a sudden this kid is this great... I, I don't think it needs to be, like, the best warrior. I just think it needs to be the bravest one. Like, we need the bravest person in Fantasia. It's this kid. Because what are the original qualifications? That oh, it's, so it's here's just actually... the greatest warrior or something? Uh, I actually meant to do research on this, and perhaps you uh, we Please can do me. that. The, um, the young boy who plays Atreyu is meant to be, based off of the sticker on Bastion's book, a Native American. And my question is whether... That actor is actually Native American. Because. <laughs> my guess is no. My guess is no, too, but. Noah Hathaway was born on November 13th, 1971, in Los Angeles to Judy and Robert Hathaway. But that's still. We could make an assumption. I don't want to make an assumption. I'm, of course. Um, he holds black belts in Tang Sudu and Shotakan. Let me see. But does not mean it's, he's not. not he, he was totally right for the role, but, it, but we're not in the world anymore where we can pretend that. Um, a brown-skinned kid is Native American. Do you know what I mean? His maternal grandfather, Leon Ringler, was a Jewish emigrant from an area that's now Poland. So it doesn't sound like it's a my my guess leading. is no. And it's also not egregiously talked about, but he is the the person on the on the land fighting the purple buffalo, and then Bastion looks to his sticker of the Native American fighting a buffalo. So mm-hmm. obviously, Bastion is filling in the pieces of, of course, Fantasia, and Atreyu was part of that. And it's the concept; uh, it's kind of the Matrix concept of this is the world as you would imagine it. I, I think so. And so, as we're you know to go back to the bookend theories when we're going. The first, the way we're setting up the world, the people should exist in his life too. Similarly to how like uh, the, the like the characters in Fantasia should kind of line up with the people in his real life. Similar like, to uh, how Wizard, Wizard of Oz, Oz. Yeah. yeah, it can work that way. I think that's a good. Uh, I actually think that's a really good comparison. It's a conscious Wizard of Oz because like, he is liter- creating it legitimately. And he's awake. That also, yeah, and he's <laughs> conscious. I got it. I'm I'm still looking up Noah Hathaway. But then there's also a subconscious element if you think about it that way. Uh, that's kind of my overall theme, like the grander theme that not very many people would get, is that we actually are all subconsciously linked and we're all in this together and building Fantasia together. So we would want – we. my goal for us as humanity is to start just – we're only going to survive this planet if we're working on this planet together. Mm-hmm. And Fantasia can be that opportunity for us to – Establish your subconscious link. Yeah, I think the two messages for the movie needs to be finding strength through social bonding and from interaction, finding the people that, like, bre- lifting each other up instead of breaking each other down. Sure, sure. And it clearly, need, there needs to be an environmental message. Like, we have this amazing, beautiful world, uh, and it's being destroyed through inaction. Gosh, that's a really good point. Because here's the thing, like, everyone in this world exists, but they send this one kid, Atreyu, to go to go wake up the princess so she can fix it. 
or wake up the, yeah, the childlike her. empress so that she can fix it. So this is where I change it. Also, is but I but here's the, yeah, but, yeah. What, but what I'm saying is no one else is doing anything. Mm-hmm. The the giant turtle is just like I don't really feel like doing anything. Right. The whole co- the whole empress court does nothing. They send a kid to go deal with it. The the scientist and the witch are just kind of like hanging out. No one else is actively taking a role. And then, so it's just Atreyu. And then, of course, when things go wrong, he blames himself. And what needs to be is, well, we need everyone to be doing things. Everyone needs to be taking an active part because this is a problem that affects all of us. And I can't be the only one here fighting because it affects you too. You should also be contributing in some way. Yeah, that's wild. It's a good point that, like, he's only... I mean, they're big, strong hands and he's not using them. Oh, poor guy. For it's just people people that haven't watched the film recently, that's the rock biter. Yeah. I'm gonna Aren't they big strong hands? If there was one quote I was aware of from this movie prior to watching this movie, it's that You're quote. You're kidding. Because I think it was made fun of in some family guy thing. Oh, probably. That that chat that tracks. But oh, I so also funny. was aware of like that scene. I don't remember why. Well again, but... th- I think this is something that just happen to play on Friday night for family night on, you know, I think it shows up on Showtime and you're yeah. watching like an ep- a, a scene of it and then you're changing the channel, you know? Yeah. So I feel like the wolf needs to represent inaction. Like the wolf. Oh, it's fear. It's like, totally it, fear. It is. And fear is absolutely important, but I feel like in a modern context, it needs to be like the wolf gets you and all you do is you just lay there. Like it doesn't even kill you. You just don't do things. Which mm. is almost worse. Like, fear can drive people to do things. I'm afraid that the world's going to end, but that's driving me to doing blank. Oh, sure. Well, so, he, the the wolf, though, says that he, he thrives on um, people giving up hope, right? So that's mm-hmm. what you're saying. Oh, okay, it's, yes, it, yes, it, yes. It, it, well, well it, it's also different. We're going a different route. Sure. And, and also... To take another step back, I kind of like the idea more of like not trying to make it parallel to what the movie was before and making a whole new film for the new kid that we're following. It's not Bastion and Atreyu is not the thing, you know, but it, but it, but it can go one of two ways. But the, the wolf in this, in the actual movie is feasting on the despair and the nothing and mm-hmm. the hopelessness and the adulthood and the lack of creativity. Mm-hmm. And the thing that paralyzes us most, I would argue, is fear. Fear of change, fear of moving forward, fear of the unknown, fear of failure. So he's kind of trying to manifest those things, I think. I think he's just a physical representation of it. I think that's fair. I think that's a good comparison which i think is a huge informative i think it's why it's important because it's looming throughout the whole thing now what they make a mistake about is if that's true that atreyu has no idea that this thing is there right so if we really want it to be a metaphor for that we he should know sooner that there is a wolf Mm -hmm. or something coming for him there should be some stakes it shouldn't be a surprise oh you're this wolf that was coming after me this whole time what a crazy thing no but he also is dealing with a bunch of things so like yeah that's the thing he has so many things our tax is the beginning of it is is i know it so okay when i was watching it on amazon it shared two pieces of information at the top straight away which just made me so angry which was so, how many horses they killed no atreyu almost died twice filming filming oh this. yeah Oh, he yeah, got, yeah. He got trampled by his horse. Mm-hmm. And when they were, he was learning how to ride or whatever. Sure. And then he got pulled under the sludge by the elevator that lowers the horse and came back. They finally, like, rescued him and he was unconscious. Unfucking. What? Yeah. What? Film I mean, conditions are bad. I mean, this is not too far away from when the people were killed on set with a helicopter, too. Like, it was. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it was just. He's an angering. So anyway, uh, what they did that the horse is not good because he's like pulling at the bit. It just it that it's horse was clearly deeply un- unhappy. It was not good, and they got a good scene, but it's you don't we don't need to watch that. We mm-hmm. can suspend our disbelief a little bit and not make a horse suffer. But it, would you still kill the horse? Oh yeah, it's very important. Now here's the thing: does the horse die? Doesn't it? Because the whole the whole. I don't remember what that area of the world is called, but it's basically just like you get pulled down into, into the swamp of despair, swamp of despair by your own sadness, swamp of sadness or whatever. And so 
I was I was joking about it with the two friends I was watching the movie with. Uh, I was like, well, the horse doesn't really die. It's just under the swamp, just in case in a pit of its own sadness. That was clearly a very sad horse, couldn't you tell? And it's just like consumed by the sadness and theoretically it would waste away to nothing. But like my pitch was that like, it's still there. Just need some happiness to bring it back oh out. Oh my God, Sam. It's going to be all right. Well, this all, actually, it's all going to be okay. It, no, it's not going to work out that no, way. No, no, that horse is dead. Totally dead. But actually, this begs the question, why is the horse sad? Like, that, that, <laughs> is, that is the question. What is the horse sad because, about? And of course, the, the horse is then sad about something, but and which then makes Atreyu sad, but not as sad as the horse was. Which because Atreyu that, should die. Atreyu was devastated. Atre- Atreyu should have sunk immediately. Well, my horse is gone. Yeah, immediately. Well, but also he's put, again, obviously the trial is that he's overcome the resilience yeah, of he's that. Able to, he's able to power through. Well, but he should have struggled a little bit more. He too should have found difficulty out of getting out of I would have loved to have known the- what he was focusing on. Like, he's like some ma- mantra he's repeating to himself sure. about uh, that makes him happy. Cause or is he- it the childlike uh, purity that... I feel like... Children can feel despair way more. Oh, I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but is there the childlike hope that drives him? So we have to say, like, yeah, maybe great. We're I'd thinking. love to know what he's thinking. Well, that's what I'm saying. The gas that fuels him is the hope that he's going to actually succeed at this. So there's nothing, even when he meets the horrible t- turtle, or I'm going to save the, pr- the empress and she's going to uh, be thankful for me and I'm going to get a medal because I'm so great. Well, he just is confident that he's going to do it, and that is. To some extent, you're going to accomplish more when you don't know what the first, like, th- that the world offers you failure after failure. Yes. That's kind of, one would argue that is your breakaway. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the Hollywood mantra. Mantra. <laughs> it's, it's better to move to Hollywood just confident that you're going to make it than to know how much Hollywood's going to, like, be, pa- lay on top of you. But like, the important thing is everything's going to be fine. Something like, well, you you take more swings. You can't. Yeah, yeah. That you have to take more swings. That doesn't mean it's not... Like, like, the important thing is you have to get back up. You can't let the, the swamp despair consume you until you're in a ball of your own despair swamp. And there's an argument to be made, not universally, but that kids have a little bit more resilience because oh, they've yeah. experienced less failure, they've experienced less... But there's, that's not obviously uh, universally true. Of course, true. and there's also the question of how much do kids hold on to that they don't reveal. Well, it's... Let's get it's a, not what, even, what we're saying is let's get a tray you into therapy. Well, he does need to be in a, ther- a therapy. Well, it, it actually... Both kids. Everyone does, actually, in life. Yeah. My, I was going to say... That's why this episode is brought to you by... He might not know what he's holding on to. That's what the trauma thing is. So there's a lot of trauma going on here that kids may not or may be processing. Mm -hmm. And trauma starts forming. And also, that that kid's killed, like, a bunch of buffalo, so... I mean, he definitely knows what life on the plane is like. Yeah. He's he's their fiercest warrior. He's a Treyu. Which... I wonder if they're like all children. I would love to meet that tribe. That would be wild. It's you know like going what I mean? to the Wook- it's like going to the Wookiee homeworld. You're just like I just have to see it. I just want to know. You just want to know. Well, didn't we get to see that with the Christmas special and no one wanted to know that? Correct. Uh, that's the joke. Yeah. Which, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I agree. So anyway, so what are the the, th- the things that he overcomes? Is he deals with the swamp? He finds the turtle. Right. The luck dragon saves him. From the wolf while he's running because it's like ten thousand. Well, he's miles actually so that actually you reminded me, and because it kind of gets muddy for lack of a better pun. Uh, he's about to sink to the s- despair. He is actually about to do that mm-hmm. after he meets the turtle. So I forgot right. that that actually does happen, and that's when Falcor swoops him right before the wolf gets him. Right. Uh, we, sh- you know, if we're remaking this, Atreyu should get a glimpse of that wolf in his like mind's eye before he passes out into unconsciousness. Like, but he should see that wolf frightening him in his image. Do you know what I mean? I feel like that wolf should be a threat that he's informed about at the beginning. Like. Oh, yeah. But then he knows how close he was. He come. Oh, yeah. To, that's all. Yeah, I agree. It should be something that we. I feel know. like that's got to be something like when Chiron says, we're giving you this medal, but be warned. You are go- like, there are forces at work that are going to try and stop you. Fear elements. We don't know what form that they will take for you. But they're going to start coming for you because they know that you're going to try to put a stop to this fear. So I want to talk about this now as we're moving forward because I know we're not getting into casting necessarily, but it's kind of important for what I think is the Hollywood problem overall is that the white male saves the foreign civilization. 
Oh, I made Atreyu female. I did too. And I made her Hispanic. I, I think she's Hispanic. I think she's a mix. I'm not sure. My, we might have chosen the same person. That'd be really exciting. It's possible. I changed it too. Because, okay. you know, early on, it's funny because like Bastion says, a little boy. But it's like, yeah, it's a white boy though, okay? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be a Native American, which yeah. is actually a better it is. story. I agree. If that's true. But I, I think it's more important to have empathy for someone who is less visually like you. And so I think it's important if, like, Bastion's a boy, then Atreyu's a girl. And, like, we're kind of empathizing with someone Oh, I who... made Bastion a girl, too. That's fine. Well, yeah, it, but that's, that's kind of what I mean is, like, I don't want it to have to be one or the other. But I, I don't agree. think we need to perpetuate the Hollywood uh, I, white male thing. Of course not. And I'm more interested in learning empathy for someone who is different from you. Mm-hmm. Of some kind. Which also ties which back... Is, which is why it's even more important when they get to the mirror scene in the second trial of... This person's just another human being. They don't look exactly like you. They're not exactly like you. They're oh, different, but they're the same. They're going through the same thing you're going through. Yeah. And and that was actually inter- Instagram for me. <laughs> the mirror is... I know it's supposed to be like Atreyu realizing he's seeing a, a bastion. Yeah. But I wanted to find a way to make it like, oh, in- Instagram thinks you need to look like this. <laughs> Which is tough for kids, but but it is also part of their culture too, and it's something that they're dealing with. Probably, they, like I don't know how you do that seamlessly, but it's something that you, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, so what I was saying is that the it's the swamp, the turtle. Yes. The luck dragon takes him to the the witch and the scientist, and then he goes through um, the two trials, and then that's kind of it. Like then the kind of the world collapses. Around then he talks him. to the oracle that. Then he actually talks to the Oracle, and then they're like, we can't do anything. Yeah. The boy needs to give us the name. And then... And then the boy doesn't... And then, like... The boy the, doesn't get it. Yeah, the two sphinxes collapse. And what does that mean? What is, what's your takeaway with... He's like, I don't... It's, I didn't know! It's like... Where he's, like, not sure he has to give the name. Here was my pitch for that, because the original concept for this movie is that, like, Bastion doesn't realize how integral to the story he is, because he doesn't really realize what's happening around him. What I would like is, as the story progresses, we keep having moments of... I'll come up with an example. Like, a tree falls on the horse. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Something. Horse. And Atreyu was trying to lift the tree off of the horse, do something... So, this is a random example. Like, to lift the tree off the horse, and he can't do it, but then all of a sudden, Bastion is there next to it, lifts... The two of them lift the tree off, and then Bastion's gone. Oh, interesting. And slowly, slowly, Bastion keeps being a little bit more in the story... Until all of a sudden, Bastion's, like, kind of realizing that, like, this is his story, too. Like, the boy has to give us the name, what boy? And then Bastion's standing there, what? No, I don't, I can't do it, I can't do it. He's gone again. Interesting. The more he believes that he's capable of helping, the more he will. And every time he doubts it and has that self-doubt and that fear, he's back out of the story and he's back in the real world in the scary, creepy black box attic. Yeah. Because, I, I, and I think that's what the movie was attempting to imply, well, like, every time he stopped reading, yeah. nothing was happening. Exactly. Like, he, yeah, you're right. So, I, but I'm trying to see if there's a better way to illustrate that. Because I think by getting him into the world, it it then it creates a different film in a little bit. Well, I, I feel like a, a little bit. Because basically we get to the point where then Bastion's at the end and he's talking to uh, IMDb credited as the childlike empress. Yes. And... And like then they're fi- he's finally face to face with one of the people, like one of the characters in the story that he's reading, and that and so that like, that's why I think it should be like wisps and like opaque and everything. And he's like in it, but then he's not. He's in it, then he's not. And I feel like like that's where we can finally like when he's finally making this decision that he's going to name her and be in in that thing, which we got to come up with a different name. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's when, he, that's when he work. finally solidifies in that world is he, I am capable, I am here, and I can help. Mm. And once he does, then it's okay, you've helped us, now the next person you're going to help is this one bully. Yeah, that's interesting. Because once you've realized that you have this confidence and that you're capable of helping, you finish this one job, now here's the next one. Yeah, you don't stop. Yeah. Yeah, because if you're capable of helping, you should continue to help. Yeah, that's really interesting. Moonchild is such a good. That's such a good point. It's so sixty specific. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what to rename her, but yeah, neither do I. But it could be also symbolic too. Yeah. It would probably have to be. Also, like, why does the fucking Empress need a new name? Well, she doesn't do shit. Well, I know, but it's just so funny that that's the thing that's making her sick. 
Yeah, my, here's my thing. I mean, I'm just thinking about this now, but my my theory as to why she needs a new name is because there's no one taking responsibility for the story, and you and you take responsibility for the story by naming your character. Naming your character. Wow, I like that. I think that's right. Okay. Um, there's also, I think you're making me think like, uh, once you can name a problem, you can fix the problem. So yeah, like knowing, I agree with that too. knowing a thing, but she's I not the problem. Yeah. But, the, but I think they're one of the it's, same ideas, yeah. similar ideas. But it's, I love that. Because once, once you've named something, you take a little bit of ownership and yeah. certainly like those problems become your problems. And I, and I also wanted to change my bastion to not be thinking about unicorns and fantasy. I wanted her my bastion to be a writer and I'm so cool with that because that's kind some sort of creative she, she should be yeah. and that's the problem uh, with remaking this film as the 1985 version or whatever whatever it was made is oh we, no i would have it I, I mean we're both setting it 2019 or yes but what i'm saying is if we're doing it directly which it doesn't work kids are allowed to be creative now of course it's we're not we don't have the same thing where as typically, where the parents are like, well, my parents don't agree with me becoming an actor. You know, that's something that we share. I agree. And those, that generation doesn't share that much. Uh, well, that's exactly it. The father is going to be someone who grew up 1985 and has the original version of this movie mentality. And now it's someone who's in a modern context, like a more progressive attitude being like, no, it's okay to be creative now. In fact, it's good. Everyone should have some sort of creative outlet because... That's how our brain, our brains have the analytical side, but every single brain also has the creative side and we should encourage and support that. Yeah. Yeah. So it does, it's kind of hard for the Bastion character to have a crux, except for the fact that they're not moving on from the mother being dead yeah. well, but, and also the bullies. I, I don't think the mother being dead is as necessary. I feel like that's unnecessary emotional stakes that really oh i could just i couldn't disagree more you think that that's important it's 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 literally the catalyst for the whole film because it's his dad is asking him to get his feet on the ground now that he doesn't have his mommy like right but i feel like the dad could be asking the kid to get the feet on the ground regardless of the presence of the mother i feel like i feel like without fridging um the mom i think someone can be struggling to find who they are and to find their place in the world regardless of whatever personal tragedy they're going through. I think that this is going to be the kid who doesn't have friends. Regard, I don't think he lost all of his friends when his mom no, died. No, no, I don't. I would agree. I think that it's compounded. Absolutely. And important that he's, as, as symbolized by our tax being the first thing to go, like this comfort it's all again. Again, it's all an oh, allegory. Okay. So you think that Artax dies because the mom died? Has died also. So, so you I, think that's the that's the the. This is the, the entry way. I can't say physical manist- manifestation. The literary manifestation of call. the pain that Bastion's going through is the similar loss. If that was, I that I love that idea. I didn't get that at all from the movie. If that's more textual in the movie, I'm on board. I think it should be. Because my my mother character plays a bigger role in this to some extent too. So, How so? Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Just just to again to put a a big piece of light on it. Mm-hmm. The this never ending story in general is the entryway into adulthood. How do you grow up but maintain your f- fantas- fantastical brain? Yeah, your hopeful brain. And so by the loss of the mother, how do you enter maturity while retaining um, your childlike wonder? Yeah. Essentially. Essentially. Absolutely. So, and by losing a mother, that is a benchmark, a young benchmark absolutely. of losing some childhood. It's, I it's assume. It's truly the death of, well, right, but it's truly the death of the woman that gave you childhood. Right. Essentially. So my childlike empress is the mom. So you cast, like, an actual an adult? adult. Oh. So, because I think it's listed as the childlike empress, and you can still call her that. She, The mother is then the embodiment of what it's like to be an adult with childlike wonder. And we get one more moment of connection, and that she can and still exist as an important, impactful part in the Bastion's life. I like that, but I'd like to make a twist on that. Okay. I... Because I, I cast a child for the child that came first. Sure, but, of course. But that, but that doesn't matter. I, what I would say is we can have the child like Empress and it can just be a nondescript figure in a bed because she's sick. Yes. And then 
he gives the Empress his mom's name. Right. So that fixes the other problem of Moonchild's an awful name. Oh, Moonchild is the mom's name. The mother is named Moonchild. Yeah. Oh, did you not know that? Like, Bastion's mom well, in the Bastion's real world mom is, is named, named Moonchild. Moonchild. That's the name that... That's why the mom's important. So... Uh, it, wait, wait, wait. Really? Yeah, 100%. That's terrible. Well, again, it's the 60s. That mother was born in the 60s, but probably named by hippie kids. So that mom is probably the hippie-dippy one. And the father is the one who's the straight-laced guy, or probably straight straightened up because they had a kid. Oh, God. Yeah, it's all there. I, okay. But the, what I'm going to suggest is he gives... The the empress, the mom's name, and she becomes the mom because oh, that way, th- that way he can both have a place for his grief and like he can and a place where he can say goodbye, but also a place where he can say, "All right, well, here's where I can believe that you, you moved exist. on to. This is the place where you exist, and now I can go and move on to whatever comes next." Yeah, there is a problem though with the both mother's of our, name is Moon. One hundred percent. Yeah. I, it's so interesting that you didn't know that. Um, it's, it's also it's, not descript. It's not clear. Do they say that in the movie? No, but it's known that that's the mom's name. Really? I, no, because he said no. He does say it. My mom had a beautiful name. He says that. Too bad she can't have my mom's name. It, she had a beautiful name. She, he does a bad line delivery of that line. All of his line deliveries are bad. Well, but he's not a horrible child actor. They, I mean, it's not his fault. They keep saying, just whisper the lines. And every time he's whispering the lines. <sighs> With such an 80s mechanic, it though. It so is. What's crazy is that a, a previous movie that I've done for this podcast is a movie called uh, The Peanut Butter Solution. Oh. Which is categorically a bad movie. Okay. But there's so many things that are about The Peanut Butter Solution that are similar to this, just in the way that they attempted to direct the children. And it's just like, there's just this kid just saying the way they're feeling and thinking instead of having to emote it. Yes, yes, because yes. Because they didn't want to try to figure out a way to get a kid to emote, it's, which is something which that they is really hard. To, oh, it's super hard. I don't want to try and do that. I don't write kids in a shit I've, because that sounds impossible. I've taught kids and that's very hard. I'm I, sure. Kids either actually have to get it or they don't. Uh, but they can play pretend, but they got it. You know, parents can also fuck kids up. Anyway, they just can't. They make the, it too big of a deal. So... Yeah, so the mom's name is Moonchild. I like that. Th- so this is what I was going to say. This begs the problem. There's a problem now. If the mom is in Fantasia, he can go back anytime he wants to go see her. Not if he gives the book away. Oh. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad. Yeah, but that would be really good. Well, that's better though, right? Like, yeah. He, then our Bastion goes on to be a good writer and creates their right. own version of Fantasia. We assume, but yes. Well, that's the idea. But I think I think the giving of the book away is such is huge. Should mm-hmm. actually happen. Also, that begs the question that the library, the Car- Carl Carl Conrad Coriander, the fucking weirdo, he's held on to the book for too long. I agree. He's I, had it for too long. And that's why he's a bitter old man, because he's not able to take things and let go. Like, he literally had to have this thing He was still taken from reading him. it. Yeah. 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 It, this guy's fucked up. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole separate thing. Truly. But that's a whole other message. Like, but but that's the thing. Like, Bastion has to give the book away, or he will turn into that old man. Yeah. I mean... That's what's really lovely about the story is that we're able to pontificate on so many of these things. Yes. What we're losing, though, it in the It certainly old, gives us space for, for that. Absolutely. The 85, the you know, the 80s version, though, doesn't hold up visually. Doesn't hold up. Like, so I have a big problem with, so Deep Roy is in is in this, and he's the guy who plays the Oompa Loompa. Oh, yeah. He's the, great. Except he, I love that actor, but the fact that they dubbed, dubbed him, him is. Is atrocious. A, absolutely awful and they did it for for all the actors in that scene yeah which and they keep shitting on this bat Uh, i think this bat shits on himself which is um could be that's just because he's hanging upside down but the (laughs) ew 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 ew. fun Um, fun fact about bats because bats do that sleep upside down uh thing did you know that bats will then pick themselves up hang from their little arms on their wings poop and then turn themselves back around? oh that's really funny it is super funny but, fun fact, listeners. Uh, fun fact about it's bat facts with Sam and Jess. Guano. <laughs> yes. But yeah, well, because they kept being like, "Oh, this dude's got this racing snail. That's awesome. I've got a dumb bat. I just fly through the sky." They but also Batman. That was, again, these are little weird allegories for uh, like of the of se- sense of self. In a weird way, we're dealing with Inside Out, the that film. Like, 
I would agree with that if they were more present in the movie, but they kind of just like are there to kind of like establish the fanta- fantastical nature totally. of the world. And then they but I think we could out. use it. And those like so that's what I was saying. These are those characters can be in her life, in our Bastion's life. Sure. Like Deep Roy, he is the teacher oh, or yeah, yeah. something Th- like that. Those are things where you pull in people from the real world. Yes, I yeah. think that way it works. Again. Oh, God. And it, Potentially, but yeah. And the council scene is so lame. Like, you know, oh, here's people with four faces. Here's big faces. I love that they created these amazing, interesting th- things. Here's the thing. It's just so poorly staged. It, again, I think they were spending money in certain places and saving money in others. Sure, sure. But, I mean, my p- pitch for for the production design is just let Jim Henson company go nuts. A hundred percent. That's what it's for. And I was talking to someone... You still um, need some... They need a little bit more It's cohesion. Go, it's going to be shot better. I'm sure our director, our writer, and all of that are going to be able to... Well, really more our director and our DP will be able to light it and figure it out a little bit better. Sure. But yeah. I mean, like, they, they created this such an interesting world, but they only used it for a little bit. Like, they created these people who were just, like, giant heads, and then we never see them again. Yeah. And that's okay. But they, but again, if we're gonna let's take the take the aspect of it being like different senses of the self, the Fantasia world can be about that too. Like absolutely, those other characters. Yeah. So it's oh god. Anyway, there's so much. Yeah. So I feel like we kind of have covered the world, our beginning and our end, are kind of what the message we're trying to say, and so and also we've kind of talked a little bit about some of the trials and tribulations that Atreyu is going to have to go through. What is there anything else about this story that we need to discuss? I see. Let's see. The answer might be no. I'm comfortable if it's no and we move on to casting. No, I think we kind of got it. And we may find more as we're going through the casting. Yeah. And again, this is more... Uh, we've certainly talked about kind of the essence of the movie as we're moving through it. And the only other note here that I had was that Gamork was... with The wolf, Gamork, is also a manifestation of the bullies. Oh, you actually too. cast a little bit more than I did. That's oh, yeah. Because there's a lot of characters. There are. I did... The ones we see the most. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, like, I didn't cast the three bullies. I did cast one of the bullies. Um, Good. That'll be the one that that, that gets the book. Yeah, totally. Because I think that's important. Good. I agree. Uh, my, I was thinking is if we were to, uh, when we remake this, these all these characters come in a little bit more than we've seen them. I agree with that. I think that if you, okay, that's fair. That's all I meant. It's like, they, we're just not like, whoo, now there's the right fighter. See you later. You know, I mean, everything that, is a little more congruous. So I didn't cast the father and I didn't cast the wolf. And now in my head, they're the same casting. Like the person who voices the wolf I, is the voice of the father. It could be to- uh, totally. There was a world where I almost gave Andy Circus all the roles. Because <laughs> it would, because there is uh, the actor that does all the voices for the uh, the characters in the original one does all like four of voices. Yeah, yeah. But I, I did cast someone for that. So, but that's Jumanji. Similarly, though, because the dad is the um, the, the hunter, the hunter, and so I I did think that though too. But the dad is not a horrible person. No, but but he is a representation of that. Someone doesn't have to be a bad person to be a representation of fear. And it it might be more impactful if let's say the wolf is about to hunt him, and then we see actually that the wolf is just a squirmy. Of course. And it also... Wig- wriggly dude. And, like, Atreyu's like, well, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die fighting. And then the wolf doesn't fight. There could be all sorts of different things. It's a bunch of different things. Like, lots of different stuff. I'd rather demystify fear. Yeah. And let it be something bigger than you think it is. And then when you see it, it's a pup or something That's like that. That's the thing. Like, I'd rather it's this manifestation of fear, but then when you actually examine it, you realize it's just not that scary. Totally. Because... The, is the fear, again, mm-hmm. that is the bigger part. It's not the actual action doing the yeah, thing. Yeah, it's being scared of the shadow under the bed when there's nothing there. Tur- turdly. Uh, okay, well then... Let's go to casting. Then let's, let's, get in, let's break into casting. So, obviously, we have to start with Bastion. You cast a female actress and I cast a male actress. Yes. Male actress, did you say? I totally did. For sure, not on purpose. So, tell me about who you have. Okay, great. So, I'm going to say her name wrong, I think. But it's the young girl who plays Pepper in the new Good Omens TV show. Oh, I the, need to watch that so bad. Oh, Tell me about what. So uh, Ama Riss is her is is how it's spelled. A M M A R I S is her last name. A- Ama probably is right, and Riss or Riss, but um, she's so fucking spicy in in Good Omens, and she's a really good actress, and I kind of like her wry sensibility, or her her sense of humor being brought to Bastion. Because she's a tough girl in Good Omens, 
And I think that our Bastion could still be tough, but is up against, you know, mean online bullies, essentially. Absolutely. How old is she? Mm, she's probably 12. That's probably born in 2005, maybe 13, 14. Literally, Google doesn't have that answer for me. It didn't have her answer. It's the, no one's updated her IMDb, so I didn't have the answer. Tragic. But she's probably 15, 14, maybe 12. But she was probably 12 when they filmed it. Probably. Yeah. She's a little bit older, but I think we'd just get away with it. Yeah. My bastion is an actor named Noah Jupe. Mm, who who is, that? is the little boy in The Quiet Place. Oh, which I haven't seen. Neither have I. But he, because I can't watch horror movies. Uh Uh-huh. Not my thing. Yeah. And I cast him specifically because he kind of looks like a, oh, I I mean, I've seen him in other things. Like, he's in Wonder. He's in, Mm. like, he's already had a pretty great career. Sure, sure, sure. And in Wonder, he's really, really good. And he has been in all of this other stuff. Like, he's in Downton Abbey and and Penny Dreadful and all that stuff. Oh, wow. And he's a good actress. He's actress i keep doing that he's a good he's a good actor it's 2019 he's 14 so it's a couple years older but but i'm sure i have i have a 14 year old kid for bastion and i have a 14 year old kid for atreyu our my kids are older too yeah basically they would work if we cast them right the second yes 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 which for all intents and purposes we'll do that yes he's in the quiet place so that means he knows how to shut up and read a book got it that's an assumption but but i got it Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You said that really aggressively. I did. Yeah, did. But I just wanted to make that joke. Oh, got it. Shut up and read a book. Uh, you mean like all the people that did sketches about A Quiet Place? No, because <laughs> at, that that's what Bastion has to do. He just to sit there and read a book. Totally. And I cast the Ama Reese girl because she's really good at like commentary. And that's... So she's probably a good one to go with. Because hmm. she's... Because our the Bastion so in the movies... All right, great. I, I, and I know her, or not know her, I know I know her work, so at least I'm a little more familiar with it. And again, I'm familiar with him because of Fair. because of Wonder. I'm assuming they're both great actors, because I've heard nothing but amazing things about Good Place, eh, not good, good Place, Omens. Good Omens, and I just need to watch it, but... It was relatively good. It's good. Yeah. It's, it, I'm glad that it's not like a t- three-year series, because by the fact that it's being done, you could just appreciate it for yeah. what it is. Cool. Good. Then let's move on to Carl, the bookshop owner. Okay. So my Carl, he's probably done more things than this. In fact, I know for a fact he has, but, and I can name some of them. But really, all I wanted is just Martin Sheen. Oh my goodness. Because he's great and he's a little bit less. Do you want him as the Glick? Oh, Martin Sheen. As the, I was thinking Martin Short for a second. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Martin Sheen, the president from West Wing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he's a yeah. little bit older now in the Amazing Spider-Man movies. He plays Uncle Ben. Right, right, right. And I I, I kind of see him as, as you said, an older version of Bastion. And it's a nice guy, but just kind of focused on his own stuff that's going on. Like, he, like you said, he never gave away the book. Who did you have? Uh, I put Emma Thompson. I think it would be funny to put her in a character as like a fake curmudgeon witchy woman. And then she like ends up being like this cool person that it's just like you just have this idea of her being a bitch but she's not no 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 no. i think of emma thompson as being one of the nicest people in the world no 100 percent. what i'm saying i'm not explaining myself well she has like a glint in her eye where she can make you think that she's annoyed with you and Uh and but for a purpose she has she has an ulterior motive which is what the coriander guide has too so I think it's fun to watch her play ulterior motive. I think she'd be a better actress at it. Got it. So you you just see her as the glint in the eye. You so you want court. So you want. I don't want Cor- Coriander to be creepy. Okay, so of course neither of us do. That's why I cast Martin Sheen. Do you want then the Carl Coriander to be subtly suggesting that Bastion take the book, or do you want Carl Carl Coriander to be like this book is my precious? And, but then Bastion takes it anyway. I think we lose the this person hasn't let go of childhood thing. And and I, what I do like that we found in talking about it, that there is, that the Coriander character created their own boundaries to see whether Bastion could have the book or not. I don't like kids. Oh, well, you don't read anyway, you know. And so our Coriander can create their own boundaries too. Okay. Uh, there's also an element where I didn't I, like the bookstore was never there and it's always been on the the walk, but this is the first time she's wrecking seeing the store kind right. of thing. Uh, just a magical element to it. 
I just don't think, I think we're not, I think we just lose the, this guy had the book forever and shouldn't have. She just knows, our Emma, or our Coriander, knows that it's time to let the book find a new keeper. I think it's, I disagree, because one of the things that I've kind of been trying to avoid lately is the idea of, like, the grand destiny, like, this is the kid that was meant to take the book. Ah, interesting. And I kind of like the idea of just chance and happenstance. And I like the idea of Martin Sheen simply because he's this just this sweet old man. He's this sweet old man who's kind of been stuck doing the same thing for a really long time. And honestly, by having the book stolen from him, that will allow him to progress further because he's kind of just been staying in his own little circle anyway. Because honestly, one of the best things that Bastion does is he takes the book. One of my biggest problems with Atreyu is that he kind of just goes from thing to thing to thing. Like someone goes, you need to go here. Okay. You right. need, and then he goes to the next place. You need to go here. Okay. And there aren't as many, like, conscious decisions. And the biggest conscious decision that happens is Bastion takes the book. Right. And I don't want that to be a setup. I want that to be something that our main character decides to do. Sure. Well, here's what I kind of like, too, about it being uh, still a white old male is kind of like passing the the throne going, hey, we've had this for a long time. You take it now. Yes. Symbolically, I like that. I still think Martin I also like the idea of we then see his uh, Fantasia, like, at the end, when we get like, and you, this is your world and you'll create it, but now someone else needs to create the same world. And we see Martin Sheen's world and you can create it big and massive and wonderful. And then we see Martin Sheen's world and it's just a small little place with just, like, three comfortable things. And because that's all, because he just picked the three things he liked and just stayed there instead of creating a big, vast, amazing world. Sure, totally. I, I still think Martin Sheen's a tough cast on that. I think he doesn't exude hopeless, end of life, pitiful kind of thing. Oh, I don't think he's end of life because I, I you're right. I don't, I don't see him as Gollum, but I do, I'm just trying to come up with like, because I like the idea of being an older white man handing I it off. I think we're going to circle back. But I, also like him because he's not creepy. A hundred percent. I think we, I think there, I just want to circle back because I think there's, it's the ideas there. I just wouldn't, like, you know how like certain stories are told better by certain actors because they tell that story well. I think sure. Martin Sheen tells the story of the tough guy who holds his ground and is kind about oh, it. I'm casting him with how he portrayed Uncle Ben in Spider-Man. Which I still think is righteous justice Mm -hmm. Mm good-hearted and you know all the things peter then aspires to someone who sees himself as a hero because he's been living this idea of being a hero for as long as he is can work that way uh but i'm happy to come back to him i'm not i'm not against it but i'm i'm more open to it than emma thompson though i think it's funny uh the next one i have is chiron okay the speaker for the empress Uh do you have someone for that i do i went first for carl so go first for chiron oh donald glover oh Interesting choice. I just wanted it to be fun. <laughs> I know. Donald Glover comes up a lot. Donald Glover's great. He's good in everything he's ever done. Whatever he's going to do. I just wanted him to bring something original to it. Yeah. Uh, Idris Elba would have been cool or something like that. Yeah. Um, or Samuel L. But like, I, but it's not appropriate. I think Donald Glover's just going to have fun with it. No. The the actor that I have is an actor that I don't know if you'll know by name. Um, he's an actor named uh, Digimon Hansu. Oh, I think I do know who that is, but I... No, can I tell you? I thought of, of him, too. Yeah. Because of the Marvel Universe. Cause, because he's similar looking to the man that's in the original film. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted right, to which be... Is, a- which, yeah, which is why I cast him. I cast him as the one for one, and I especially cast him because he's old. Old-ish. He older? I mean, he's 55. Oh, interesting. He's fucking um, killing it. Like, this person who speaks for the child like Empress, and like, oh, we're just an adult handing things off to kids. What do you mean? I mean, it's, look it up, we're in a room full of adults, and then this kid shows up, and they're like, all right, you're our one true hope. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to go with Donald Glover, but it, <laughs> I misspelled Guardians. Uh, but he's in Captain Marvel, he's in Blood Diamond, Guardians of the Galaxy. He's oh, yeah, also he's in the excellent. new Shazam movie, where he, in the new Shazam movie, he plays the original wizard Shazam, and he's handing off his grand destiny oh. to a child. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, he's definitely He's for sure done this before. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, liter- I'm literally typecasting him for that reason because he w- he's the wizard Shazam. And I just thought it was funny. And I, for one thing. And they don't look similar, but they, uh, it's I should similar be essence. clear. Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, uh, that, that could be and I, and I think you're pull of, a microaggression and I don't mean it to be. Of course. And I think your pull of Donald Glover is, is clever because I, there are so many, few characters in this movie of color that we certainly can't take one of them away. And and I actually cast 
Well, no, I don't. I'm not giving Donald Glover the the token black role either. You're not. That's what I'm not. That, I'm not suggesting. But like, I'm glad that you cast a black actor. Uh, I just wanted someone who's going to bring something different to it, and I thought he would. Um, the one, and again, I like Donald Glover. The only thing I would suggest is if Donald Glover is in the movie for even a little bit, won't people be upset that he's not in the movie more? That's the typical com- complaint with him. Yeah. Totally. And there is a problem where I was like, wow, I've got a really stacked <laughs> actor list. Is it all A-listers? Pretty much. Yeah. But kind of. For me, I have a, I, I, when I'm doing casts like this, I often try to avoid A-listers as much as I can, although I certainly have a good chunk of them as well. Just because a lot of times we see them and we think, oh, you're this person. Yeah. I like casting some of the more unknowns, but that's but just me. But even the quote unquote unknowns still have story about of them. Course. Like I said, I'm happy to go with Donald Glover. Well, I, I mean, I love Digimon. Um, and I know we're pronouncing his name wrong and I feel terrible do about you, it. Yeah, that is awful. We should G- know it. Jimon? Jimon? I don't know. You gotta look it up now. Jimon Hansu. Jimon Hansu. Jimon Hansu. It's pronounced Jimon Hansu, says the internet. Got it. And uh, you know what? We did the right thing in cor- Looked it up. correcting ourselves. Uh, Jaiman Hansu is a good cast. So I'm o- I'm it's I'm open to both. It All might right. also be dictated by who we actually ultimately decide on directing and uh, writing. Eh. Because I, I have a... I just want someone to punch it up, make it more interesting. Yeah. Well, my writer's fantastic. Um, So's mine. I'm... We'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens okay. when we get there. I'm really excited about my writer. My director's fine. But I'm really excited my about my writer. My director's great, too, yeah. I think. All right. Let's go with Jem and Hansu for now, then. Okay. Yep. Great. Uh, and now uh, let's talk about Atreyu, because if there's a possibility that we cast the same person, I could not be more excited. Yeah. So... You want to say it at the same time? You went first for Chiron, so let me go, go first yeah. for Atreyu, because I cast Daphne Keene. Me too! There it is! <laughs> <laughs> I did! I thought she was a fucking badass! She's the best, and she's perfect for Atreyu. Perfect. If, if you don't know who who Daphne Keene is, she plays X-23 in the movie Logan. She is this tiny little girl who is basically a, a clone or someone who has the same powers as Wolverine, and... In Logan, she's far more badass than than Wolverine, and she really only speaks Spanish, and, like, they have this, like, Western across the United States in this weird apocalyptic future, and it's just the best. It's just cool. I I, I think she's cool, and she's gonna kill it. Uh, I did just... Literally. Oh, truly. Yeah, I also watched uh, one of the most recent episodes of Barry, where he's doing a lot of... um, Taekwondo, and there's a, a feral child, and she's excellent in it. But Amazing. I, I don't know what kind of actress she'd be, so I was like contemplating her. But as far as like ultimate badass, just gonna it, it ha- like carry the weight of the film, she it has it. to be Daphne Keene. I fully agree. Great, I have, cool. Then settled. So then the next person I have is the childlike empress. Now I cast a child. Yeah, but, I'm, cu- no, I'm more curious who you cast, but. And you cast an adult. I did. Okay. Because well, I'm changing it. Right. Which is fine. And I like that interpretation, especially if it is the mother, which mm-hmm. I did not do. Because mm-hmm. I like that interpretation better. My actress is an actress named Faith Herman. She's been in a few things recently. Most recently, she was in Shazam. Let's and see. she is just delightful. Oh, well, that's great. Oh. Yeah. Like, I watched this Oh, movie. she's in This Is Us. Yes. Oh, she's great. Yes. And, like, I watched that movie, I was like, I have to use this kid. This kid's oh, so shit. good. That's good casting. Like, she's really good for the Childlike Empress because she's, like, you know, fun. <laughs> I think that's really good casting. I'm willing to give it to you if we, let's say, we keep the Childlike Empress a child. And but I like the idea of him saying goodbye to his mother. It's all there. Yeah, but I want him to actually, if, like, if it does turn out, like, this is the place where he's... He's saving the idea of who his mother was. And it gets the book away. It's a, it's yeah. a hugely more symbolic thing. Yeah, so that's why I think we have to go with that. And my actress is Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt as Amarisa's mother? Yes, because I believe that young actress is half black and I have a black father cast. Ah. Uh, uh, it, it, I don't think we need to overthink it. Of course not. And I'm certainly not... Living in a world where a black kid has to have black parents, a white kid has to have white parents. No, and and I'm also... Because one one of the things that the Fant Four Stick movie did, which is great, is they're like, yeah, that, you know, people can be related, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to be realistic, but I'm also was casting colorblind for the most part. Like, not colorblind, I was casting 
just open-mindedly, you know? Of course. Who's going to work with what? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I love Emily Blunt. Yeah, the, we have no information on her at all. That's fine. Which is totally fine. Yeah. All right, we can go with Emily Blunt. Well, yeah, I just like... She's also, like, age-appropriate to have a 12- year, 13-year-old, you know. We could have cast her son as Bastion, but no. Her son? She's a son? In The Good Place. I'm sorry, not The Good Place. The Quiet Place. Oh, well, interesting. That would have been funny. It's too bad we've already moved on. We have moved on. Um, uh, all right. So, so did you cast the dad? No. I, so I'll tell you who the dad please, is. Please, tell me who the dad is. Um, is William Jackson Harper, who is Chidi who... from Good Place. So you do know him. Oh, yeah, of course I do. So what I like about that casting, though, is Chidi, the, the character, is a fearful, you know, paralyzed character by fear. Mm-hmm. And we and and William Jackson Harper plays that well. He does. And so I, in this I would have I would have him still take a little bit more of the original father and Oh, have totally. A, and be a little bit less anxious. Yeah. He should absolutely still be an embodiment of fear, but a different outward representation of that fear. Like he yes, he's, he's so, afraid of everything, so he he takes that out on the people around him. Yeah, I'm not casting Cheaty, I'm casting the actor who of can play that. Sure. Uh so yeah, and I think they also just make a cute little kid together, I'm sure. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my casting for that. All right, cool. So the next two people that I have are the old man scientist and witch. I'm so excited to tell you who I am. I I'm just gonna tell you the two people that I have. Oh no, I went first for I went first for the last one. So no, it doesn't I, matter. I went first for that. All right. You, I cast. I'm just gonna do both of these at the same time. Yes, because of course. As far as I'm concerned, they're interchangeable. Yes. Oh. And well, I mean, like either one can play either role. Okay. Um, because I cast two women. Oh. And in my initial concept, I was like. Why isn't it just the same person? Why Why does this need to be two people? And then I was like, no, it's kind of fun if they have like the kind of back and forth. You get, a, you get a little bit of jokies. Yeah. And so I kind of want to cast people who are contemporary, but I, I'm, I'm sure they've worked together, but I don't know a specific instance when Susan Sarandon and Diane Keaton worked together. Oh my God. I don't think so. But I'd like to see that. Oh, that's so weird. Yeah. That's really weird. They're very different. But also they're not going to say yes to those roles. Why? Because they're A-listers. It's Ideal Remake. We can get whoever we want. I know, but you told me not to cast A-listers, too. I did. But this is the one where, I, like I said, I, I also did that a lot for this. I didn't do it for the kids. Because the ki- like, cause if you're doing a movie with kids, you can't cast A-list kids because A-list kids don't exist, really. Yes. Well, they do. Well, depending. On, yeah, anyway. We, yeah, it's hard to... Good, yeah. There's very few up and coming kids that everyone's aware of but i kind of i mean because basically the way it was done is it was done like um the princess bride where it's i'm gonna blank on this woman's name who is op- acting opposite billy crystal where like the two of them are going back and forth hold on go for it that's who i cast so i billy think crystal it's and- funny to bring them into those roles but they've, they've literally played those which roles is before. why you do it so it kind of is like a nod to the parents that are watching this film, I just think it's great. I'm look. What is that actress's name? So it's name? Carol Kane and All Billy right. Crystal. Here's the thing, I'd love to use Carol Kane. She's great. Billy Crystal, it's he. He isn't in trouble. He's in is anything, but it's a lot of reports say that he's just kind of an asshole. Yeah, I've heard that. And so, given but the also, option, given the option, I'd rather have a have a set a nice without person. assholes. Sure. So I'm more than happy to go with Carol Kane. That's brilliant. You can't do that. Those two. Kids. I think you can because everyone knows Billy Crystal and no one talks about Carol Kane. And I'd rather have more people talk about Carol sure. Kane. Sure. And you know, you you can also yeah, and you bring I, Carol. And, Kane I, and I also in. like the idea of it being two women. I don't. I actually really like that idea. But then you. Then who do you bring in? It's like well, Carol. We Kane. have Susan Sarandon and Diane Keaton. Pick one. Oh, it's, I don't like either of them for those roles. All right. I'm not just because I don't see them as character actors. That's all. All right. Uh, I'm sooner like let's think Tony Collette. They let's think um, Tracy Ullman. It's I'm trying to think. Have Susan Sarandon and Diane Keaton never worked together because they don't like each other? You know, like, I'm trying to think know. of what the harmony is. Well, that, well that's why I'm set. saying pick one. Because, I mean, I feel like Diane Keaton... I uh, don't think they work well opposite Carol Kane. I just don't. And that's why I think it's funny. It's just like, they're so different, but they just enjoy each other's... Co- I mean, it's very... Uh, I'm going to blank the name on this, too. What's the name of the TV show on Netflix? Oh, the oh the one with Jane Fonda yeah. and Frankie and... Frankie and whatever, and Jane Fonda. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's a good casting. Yeah. 
But it, but they're two very, very different people. One of them is character, one of them straight. You know what? I'd rather cast two uh, lesbians. I'm not even necessarily implying that they're lesbians. No, but I'd rather, we I mean, not necessarily lesbians, but I'd rather see two, an older woman couple. Grace and Frankie. Grace and Frankie. Yeah, that's why I want it to be two women. Yeah, because it's an older couple, do you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, then I think we cast Lily Tomlin and Carol Kane. I, I, it, because we already have Carol Kane, I feel like Lily Tomlin is, it's just two of the same. And that's why I would, of the two of them, I would take Jane Fonda. God, that's so funny. Because, because that's kind of the dynamic they have here where the, it's, the, it's the, um. Well, Lily Tomlin's the straight man in a different way. Right. But it's the, it's the Oscar and Felix kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Where you want to have the person that's a little bit out there, and you want to have the person who's a little bit more straight laced. But Carol Lace, like Carol 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 Kane, is the Felix, and Lily you think Tomlin. Carol Kane is the Felix. Oh yeah, totally. And and she's Lily the, Tomlin's she's, the Oscar. Carol Kane's the the character actor. The character actor always is always going to be the. But Oscar. Thomas Lennon played Felix, and that's a character actor also. That is and, a strong argument. But he's also well who. Jack Lemon played him too. Who it, who was uh, that's so these are strong who, who characters. Who was the Oscar to Tom Lennon's Felix? Matthew Perry, which I think it oh. should have been opposite. But it shouldn't have been opposite. Thomas Lennon shouldn't have been cast. Matthew Perry should have been well, actually, if Matthew Perry is gonna be in that show, he needs to be Felix. Yeah, I agree with that. And I don't think it worked because he was Oscar. Yeah, Thomas feel, Lennon feel, though is the best Felix. I feel there like is. if you're trying to cast if you're casting Matthew Perry in that role, you're just asking for another Charlie Sheen situation because that you're literally casting him to be the, you're kind of casting him based on like kind of stuff that's happening in the real world. That's a terrible idea. And I love Matthew Perry. He just wasn't a good Oscar. No. I don't think. It just was a stretch because we know him as the neurotic, lovable Chandler. And so yeah. we want to see him as that. And said as a curmudgeon, it wasn't good casting. So I see Lily Tomlin so then as here, the curmudgeon. So then here's another option. Yeah. Lisa Kudrow. Oh, well, but then you can't have Carol Kane. So, because they're both ditzes. So, what ah, we're looking it. at is Lily Tomlin, who is the realist, wry, sarcastic, and Carol Kane is the loof, woo 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 woo. So, we're looking at two different dynamics then. But they're both the characters. Because Carol is Kane. Great. You want two character actors? Which is, again, the argument with Matthew, uh, forgive me, Jack Lemon and. Who's the other guy who plays Oscar in the original? Oh, I don't remember. Those Both of those men that originated the role are character actors. Okay. Uh, they both are, are to be character actors. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the goal being that they bring different elements. Lily Tomlin, who is a character actor, but also plays just straight up herself really well. Sarcastic and grounded, but also maybe too unmoving. And Carol okay. Kane's out in the world, in the air. And those are two different elements, but they're the same. All right. Carol Kane and Lily Tomlin. I think that is right. I like it. The only other character I have cast mm. is the voice of the luck dragon. It was just someone to do a bunch of like the different character voices. Sure. Do you have someone for that? I do. Okay. I went first to the last one, so go ahead. Oh, uh, I, <laughs> I don't think he'd do it because it's too similar. Mm-hmm. But I cast Benedict Cumberbatch just to do Falcor. Ah, got it. Funny. The person that I cast is someone who is known as the creature actor in terms of voiceover. So it's not someone who is... We haven't talked about this. How do you see this movie being done? You see it being motion capture CGI? Oh, not really, no. I see most of it being practical. Again, I agree. I, that's that's like absolutely Jim Henson going nuts. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want... To... There's a part of me that was thinking Jim... Sorry, uh, what's his name? Andy Serkis, you said. Nope, nope, nope. Guy who brought the the Muppets back for us. Jason Siegel. Oh. Kind of getting him involved because he likes that world so much. But I don't know that I would want to work with him necessarily. I don't think so either. No, I, I don't know anything wrong with him. I just don't think that this, this is the right fit. It's not fit. the right fit yeah, for yeah. him. Um, but yeah, I think this is like Henson Company going nuts, full creature puppet, so. all that. Anyway, but so that's why I cast a voiceover actor. He's the, probably one of the things he's really famous for just in terms of like, the, you know all the names is like he's Klaus the Fish and American Dad. But his first role was he was Olmec from Legend of the Hidden Temple. Oh. He was both Appa and Momo. From uh, what? Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, oh. Which, oh my god, Justin, you need to watch it. And he is, anytime you have a cartoon or anything animated where you need something to speak with a voice that it, like a cre- like creature, that. like they have been 
one of the descriptions for D. Bradley Baker is that if you need someone to come in and be a swamp, he can walk into the studio and be a swamp. And I think it's actually good of you to cast specifically someone who's trained as a character yes. voice actor, mm-hmm. because there is a complaint in the industry itself that a lot of that training is going to waste because they're just giving it to the to, Benedict yeah. Cumberbatch and stuff, which makes sense because you want names and things. Mm-hmm. And But I would... Sooner go, yes, Rockbiter mm-hmm. should be that guy. All, like, he should yeah. do all the things. I like Falcor as being a recognizable voice, though. I'm not sold on it, but it could really be fun. I mean, who was Falcor in the first one? Is the guy who played all the oh, other voices. Yeah. I, I want someone, because it's, like, the imagination and it's someone who is capable of doing all the voices, like, I like D. Bradley Baker because he can do he all those voices. He could create those great and voices. every single one would be distinct and unique because that's what he does. And that's one that I feel... So I cast Rockbiter, did you? No, no, no. I cast Rockbiter as Jack Black. I just thought he'd be funny in it. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be. It's not exactly great casting, but it could be great. And is that all you cast too? For voices? In general. Yes, that's the end of my list. So, because I put Gamork as Andy Circus, because I, I wanted him to be bigger, a bigger character in it. I, if we're doing that, I would want Gamork as the wolf. Yes. I want the wolf to be William Jackson Harper. William. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I wonder if he's if he can do the physicalization. But it's a puppet. He just needs to voice it. That's right. We're it, we're not doing motion capture, so it, what matters is that. Do we lose though the imagery if we don't know that it's the dad? Like we have to assume that we know the voice. I don't even think we need to assume we know the voice. Yeah, it's just I think it's more about the production design of it, and it's what it represents. And if you have this kind of knowledge in the course of production. Then it's kind of just like a, like just like kind of the essence you put forth. I don't think it's necessary for everyone to go. Oh well, this is the person who's voicing the wolf, so this is what it represents. I think if we like, it's somehow we can also have a similar. Well, not to cut you off, I'm sorry that I did, but like there could be an indication that the dad because the cough, like the dad coughs a lot. Sure, you could have anything. Yeah, but I, I, I think that (laughs) if we're doing something like that, I think it's more important that. We do what you said. We tie it back to the real world, and the wolf should be the dad. I I do like that. Then I think I would move Andy Circus to the rock biter. I just want to like. I honestly think D. Bradley Baker should do like the different voices and just like pull in it general in because that, like well, we, we should get some voiceover talent to do the things that are voiceover stuff. And maybe not. Maybe that guy doesn't do all the ones. We just cast for the people that are right. Like, I mean, there are amazing voiceover talents that uh, I can go through and pull, but like if I, we just because there's what. There's the Luck Dragon, there's there's uh, the Rock Biter, and there's the Turtle. And then there's the Wolf, but that's the dad. Yeah, and I think you're, you're and right. And then there's the Sphinxes, but I don't care about that either. Oh, God, I gotta tell you, I love that you can see the nipples. It's just so cool to me. Because it's like, fuck, we all have nipples. Let's just look at it. Like, it's not a big deal. They don't over-sexualize it. You know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. It doesn't I'm, bother I'm just me. Finish. It doesn't bother me. Okay. I just think it's great. No one brought it up. I know. I've been wanting to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Also, I cast the characters in the top, at the top, with the with the bat and the snail. Oh. Like you cast the actors? Yeah. All right, let's hear it. I um, do want to go with for D. Bradley Baker for the voices. I right? agree so with you. That. So forgive me. That's what I, I assumed that we were agreeing. What are their agreement. character names? Oh, actually, yeah. So so D. Bradley Baker does that. And then I, I actually forgot to change my uh, rock biter. Jack Black is my night hob. Which one's is the one with the uh, is the one with the bat is the one with the bat that's better casting. You know, it would be funny. Who is no? Because I don't think they do this. If it was Jack Black as one and the other member of Tenacious D as the other. Oh yeah, they they're a little old for it now. But well, I cast Deep Roy again and let him use his real voice. (laughs) Done. (laughs) Yeah. Nope. That's uh. That's great. (laughs) Oh, it's um. Teeny Weenie, Weenie, which is a terrible name. It is. And then Night Hub. But you have to assume that this person wrote that in the novel. And Okay. So then, bef- did you have any other characters? I think You had that's... one of the bullies. Oh, yeah. The heavyset kid, Jeremy Ray Taylor from It. Okay. Because I think he'd just be an, another allegory for like a, a, a angry white boy <laughs> yeah I've, I've used him for other things as well he's very good cool then let's go back and finalize 
Carl. The only reason I would say let's go with Martin Sheen over uh, Emma Thompson is because I think you've gotten more than me. Yeah. Oh, but that doesn't... If I'm right, I'm right. I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I am right, I'm right. We're going to go with Martin Sheen. Okay, great. All right, cool. So that is all the cast I have. Let's talk about writer and director. So let's start with writer. The writer that I have... Uh, so th- I, the reason I picked this woman is because... She has written things for kids, but she's, mm. she, so she wrote um, this movie called Box Trolls. Oh. Which I love. It's funny. It's sweet. It's amazing. And I think it's super wonderful. And then she also wrote a movie that is funny and sweet, but then just emotionally devastated Ooh. me. She wrote the Netflix adaptation of the book, The Little Prince. Oh, did she? And it's so good. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's a writer named Irina Brignall. Yeah, I don't know her, but... But that's why I picked her. Because she writes kids things really well, and she's done an adaptation, which this is sort of like, and she's done an original thing, and she's kind of able to take those things and blend them together. And I just think she's able to pull in these amazing ideas and use it for that. Great. And so that, that's why I liked her. I love that. Um, and in fact, it might be better than mine, but um, I wrote Mindy Kaling because I just want Mindy to do some. Uh, you know. Right. It doesn't think she'd be great. I think mm-hmm. she could do it. I, I don't know that she's specifically written things for children. It might not be her wheelhouse either, but I'm sure she could figure it out. <laughs> Let's go with your lady. Okay. So then uh, tell me about your director. Ron Howard. Ooh, why Ron Howard? I think he would do a great job. Okay, tell me why. Because he's, he's, he's skilled. He, wrote, he did Splash. It was great. Cocoon is great. What has he done like this? Well, that's the thing. Maybe it's good that he hasn't done something similar, and so he can try something different. The, the way Ron Howard has been described... Because Ron Howard's done a lot of amazing things. Like, he did... Did he do Apollo 13? Yeah. Yeah. Apollo 13, Splash. He's done a number of really, really good movies in the 80s. He's the voice of the guy. Like, he's... He's in, um... He just has all the resources. He He does. Arrest Development. Thank you. Arrest Development. Why couldn't I think of that? Doesn't matter. He did Arrest Development, and he's done all of those things at that time, because at the time, those are the the cutting edge of movies. Unfortunately, what's kind of been described about Ron Howard now is that sometimes you go to Ron Howard if you want the safe choice. Ah. Well, yeah, I don't think he's going to... I think he's going to, well, that's a really, I, I kind of almost like that. If he's going to go the safe choice, then he's going to use the Muppets and he's going to. Right. The, the, and so here's the thing. I'm not 100% sold on my guy either, but that also means we might not necessarily have it. Right. The director that I picked is the director who is directing the new Dark Crystal series. So the Got Dark it. Crystal series is because specifically because he's used to directing Muppets. Right. So Dark Crystal is... The, it's kind of the movie Jim Henson always wanted to make. It is a dark movie starring Muppets. Right. So, and that was like his passion project. And it was never especially successful. But the people who love that movie love it. They're wrong. It's a terrible movie. <gasps> I'm sure it's true. It's, it, it's just so slow. Anyway. It, all those movies are, though. Yeah. Because it's like, it's taking the time to really seep in the world. Ugh. But so it's a director named uh, Louis Leterrier, who let me pull up his IMDb page. Yeah, I think that's what's interesting about the never ending story is that they don't rush certain things. But and I like that when a film doesn't rush. Certain yeah, things, I, I like that it takes its time, but it also needs to, you know, they're dragging out the story. They're not teaching us anything yeah. while we're watching people go through it. So he's currently doing Dark Crystal Age of Resistance and a bunch of other movies. Uh, <laughs> he was. He directed Now You See Me, but he also did The Brothers Grimsby. He did Wrath of Titans. And he hasn't really done television. Oh, I'm surprised. He's mostly a, a movie director. Oh, yeah, he did he, The Incredible Hulk. Yep. Interesting. Mm-hmm. He was, and then he did Transporter, Transporter 2. He is a, the Hulk aside, a practical effects kind of like action director kind of guy. Well, then I think that's right. And again, that's kind of the idea of what I wanted, and I'm per- perfectly happy to find someone else. Well, and I kind of just like Ron Howard because he has a reverence for that era also. He does. And I and I would want someone to be reverent to that to some extent. I do, but I also want someone to throw out the things that don't work. I yep. don't want everything to be paying homage to. I want it to be... Totally. Th- well, that worked then, but this is what will work now. Totally. And I'm more quick to agree with you. Okay. All right. For the sake of time... Since we've been at this for an hour and a half, uh-huh. let's go with uh, Louis Leterrier then. Mm-hmm. Then yeah. So then let me take you through our casting. Great. 
the never-ending story keeps going. Uh-huh. Yes, it does. Bastion will be played by Amaris. Carl Coriander will be Martin Sheen. Mm-hmm. Chiron is Jaimon Hansu. Atreyu is Daphne Keene. The childlike Empress, Empress will be Emily Blunt. I love it. And the dad and Gamork will be William Jackson Harper. Old Man Scientist and Witch will be Carol Kane and Lily Tomlin. So good. Teeny Weenie is Deep Roy. Night Hob is Jack Black. <laughs> Bully is Jeremy Ray Taylor. And the voice of the Luck Dragon is Dee Bradley Baker. Uh, all this will be written by Irina Brignall and then directed by Louis Leterrier. And that is our new never-ending story. I think we did good. There we go. So yeah. Great. I appreciate you bringing me on. I, I, well, I, this is the thing that we didn't do at the beginning. So Jessica, tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so qualified to do this because, uh, well, I'm an actress. I'm funny. Uh, I do internet things sometimes. Tell me about your internet things. Uh, I promote your internet things. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm on Hyper RPG Live. We play. I play tabletop games, which is a what for those who don't know. Uh, basically, Dungeons and Dragons role playing games. I mean, what what medium? Where is it? Oh, it's online. It's on Twitch. That's so, the answer. No, I'm gonna get there. All right. I was leading them down the path. So on Tuesdays on Twitch for Hyper RPG, <laughs> we play the Tales from the Loop system, hmm. uh, which is a really fun system where we're all kids from the 80s trying to run around. So if you like Stranger Things, you may like this. Oh, that's so perfect. Uh, but now we've gotten into time. So we're like curling Tales in Time right now. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. And I play a really psycho bitch named Chrissy. Which she's great, though. She's just really troubled. You're the, you're the chaotic one? I'm always the chaotic one. Yeah, but my Chrissy uh, was the rich girl. Like, I, I, I put her as, like, the hardcore pretty and pink girl. Uh, what's her face? I'm trying to decide if i Molly and Ringwald. Pink. Oh, got it, got it. Molly Ringwald. So that's what my, that character's in on Tuesday. So that's Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and on Wednesday, no, 6 p.m. And then on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., I do Rat Queens, which is an RPG, the official RPG of the Rat Queens comic, which is um, a bunch of awesome chicks that are, that are basically like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Marauding team in the D&D world. And it's off of this great comic that Curtis Weed created. And it's all at www.twitch.com. TV slash hyper RPG. That's awesome. That's oh, so that's a hyper RPG show as well. That is a hyper RPG show as I'm well. I'm not sure I knew that was a hyper RPG show. That's amazing. Yeah, they do awesome content five days a week. So, and I'm just grateful to be a part of it nine times out of ten or two times out of five. The important that's thing the is one. you're there. Yeah, I'm there and I love it. And uh, yeah, and I do fun. I, I work. I'm with Ripley Improv, and we just filmed three improvised films back to back just completely improvised not like we didn't even have an outline and we we got a suggestion and even the camera and everything was improvised so that's awesome and it turned out great uh so that people will see that one day do you have social media or anything you'd like to promote oh, or people I, to follow you on i do thanks for asking i'm on instagram at jessica lynn verdi with an i and on twitter with where's the i at the end of my verdi name at the end of verdi not yeah. in lynn lynn has a y yeah, so Jessica, L-Y-N-N. Got it. Verdi, V-E-R-D-I. I know, no, you're right. I heard with an I and got confused. So you're right. And Jessica Verdi on Twitter. Okay. Yep. Awesome. I do funny things on Twitter sometimes. You can confirm. Yeah, thank you. You did a recent, like, you were recently catching up on all the Marvel movies, and you <sighs> would live tweet watching the Marvel movies, and... If I happened to be like on Twitter at the time, it was it was always very very. It's funny. an enjoyable. I I didn't do it for the last couple because I needed to catch up in order to get to the end sure. game because uh, it was just too much. But I really loved doing it because and it was what's interesting is that people liked reliving them that way too. You know, sometimes you feel like you're talking into a void. But. Yeah, and I didn't. I mean, like, when I was seeing that, I'm like, ooh, what part of the movie is she... Because sometimes I'd get it, sometimes I wouldn't. Yeah. And you had crushes on characters I didn't think you would, and... I I walked away with a fucking crush on the raccoon. On the raccoon? (laughs) That's awesome. It was really weird. I was like, oh my god, I empathize with the raccoon. (laughs) The raccoon's so sad. I know. It's actually broke... It breaks my heart. The Yondu Uh, character breaks my heart. I, I think I do walk away with the Guardians being my favorite part of the franchise. That's awesome. Yeah. I could... But I also entered with more information on them than anybody else and i'm also a huge robert Downey jr fan yeah of i mean course. it's just all heartbreaking it's all so much yeah so i do fun things cool yeah uh if you're interested in finding out more about me i'm at sam gash on twitter s-a-m-g-a-s-c-h with or an i there i am sam gash <laughs> on twitter 
<laughs> S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H. Uh, and then if you want to follow the podcast, we are Ideal Remake on Twitter and Instagram. Spelled like it sounds. And then you can join us on Facebook at Ideal Remake or Ideal Remake Podcast. And that's where people debate about all this stuff. That's that where said. they're supposed to. It's fine. Everything's fine. I, everyone loves me. Uh, yes. <laughs> your parents do. They, yeah. yeah, probably. They, they've told me that once. Uh, <laughs> and if if you can do one thing for the podcast this week, if you would tell one person in your life about about Ideal Remake, I would certainly appreciate it because lots of people enjoy NeverEnding Story. And I think that Jessica brought in a lot of good ideas for this movie and they deserve to hear about them. Oh, thank you. And I want to say that you did as well. You made me really solidify what this could be. I really do think it... Probably, if we're going to really remake it, we don't even talk about Bastion. We do a whole new world. Someone else found the book. Or it's like I mean, Bastion's grandchild. Yeah. I, I, it, the kid will have a different name. Like, I, I agree kid. with at the beginning, it'll be a it'll be a Jumanji type situation. I think so. But with what we did here, I think we're walking away with a yeah. more timeless film. Well, and this one is ripe for a million stories. Yeah. It's, it's the perfect playground to do whatever you want. So there really was Lit- no wrong. Literally, yes. There's no wrong. Well, that's exactly why it was wonderful. Yeah. There's no wrong we could have done, even though I still don't agree about Martin Sheen. But we're going to let just Right. It, we're gonna let it lie crazy thing when we redid the matrix i did not agree with the person who was our director and within two months they were just like here's the reason why this person was the best director and i was like oh shit they damn oh how funny yeah because literally that director then two months later came out with crazy rich asians and it was just like oh Fuck. they would have been great yeah yeah and and you know it's all that's why there's negotiations that people of course. don't always get the role that we think they're going to get. It's always going to be a little bit here, a little bit there. Well, we're doing a virtual handshake and agreement. Let's end with this. Okay. What is your favorite quote from this movie? Oh, wow. Do you have one? I was looking up quotes from the movie to come up with the with my intro. The And if, like, if you're looking for one of those movies and video games and arcades, that's down the street. Here, we there are no beep, beep, beeps. We're just reading this books really here. It's really funny. Yeah. There aren't that many quotes. Like, the only other quote that... I, I mean, the biggest quote that everyone, like, references is, Moon Child! Yes. Screamed into the wind. Yes. And then, they look like big, strong hands. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could pull out of the thin air something that was, like, inspiring. And I don't think I can do that right now. But then, this is a question I never asked, and I will ask this to end on. Who's your favorite character? Oh, Falcor. Yeah. Although, fuck, man. I don't know. Well, Blue, then. Blue he, Child's so pretty. She's so good. She's so she's, vulnerable. Yeah, that actress does an amazing job. I wish she had more to do, but she doesn't. She kills it. Yeah. But I, I think, think I, I love Falcor. We you gotta just, end, then we gotta end this the way that the movie ends. Fist up in the air. Woo-hoo! Yeah! 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 It's so real. This is it. This is what's happening. <laughs> awesome. Thanks.